Welcome to My Healthy Mind. I'm Michael Hunter. Today we pick up where we left off last week with the incredible, often disturbing story of Rick Worsey Jr., a.k.a. White Boy Rick, who, against the backdrop of a childhood spent in one of Detroit's tough inner-city neighborhoods where drug trafficking and violent crime were all too familiar, became entrapped by the FBI as a drug informant at the age of 14. The rest is a 32-year odyssey of imprisonment and abandonment involving the FBI, local government, police, and one cruelly victimized boy. Stay with us as we continue with one man's long struggle for justice. So here we are where the world has heard so many versions of your story, not having had an opportunity to really hear it from you. And we're about to and go from your past, which you know, to what is probably going to happen in your future, which you're very uncertain of. So now take me to your moments right before you step out that door. Do you feel like I'm about to be free? I felt like I was about to be free, but I knew there was a lot of things that would come with it. You know, and parole being one of them. You're free, but you still have to walk a fine line and make sure that, that, you know, nobody pulls you off of that line or nobody sets, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and lie. I had worries of, of people setting me up. You know, I knew there were people that was, everybody that I've met since I've been home, not one person has said anything negative. A lady yesterday, older lady, and I took a picture with her and she said, these are my two sisters from Augusta, Georgia. And they said, well, we want a picture. And she had told them my whole life story, what she know of it. And it just amazed me that here was this lady telling her family in Augusta, Georgia about me and, and speaking up for me, you know, like what was done to him was wrong. He was, you know, this is an injustice. And, and it just makes you feel good to know that there's people out there that were beating that drum with me and praying for me and, and, you know, signing petitions and writing letters and making phone calls. And to all of them, I'm, I'm forever grateful. And so what's your concept of that 30 years right now? You can never get time back. You know, I lost a lot in those 30 years. I lost most of my family. My grandmother, which was like a mother to me, my grandfather, uh, all of my mother's side of the family, my father, you know, so those years, the one thing, you know, to me, Mike, the most valuable commodity in the world, people might think it's oil or gold, is time. Because it doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter who you are. You can never go back in time. You can never replace lost time. So my advice to you and everybody is to live every moment of your life to the fullest. And now here we are. We've stepped outside of that gate. And now you're in a time where life is yours again. And, and what's happening with Rick today? Uh, I'm trying to, I try and do productive things. Every day I try and do something that's productive. I wake up in the morning, a good friend of mine sends me a read, a religious, you know, a daily read from a book. I try and start my day off reading that. To start it off the right way, I get up and try and do the right thing every day now. Whereas before I would get up and, you know, every day, it's hard to be a criminal. Okay. It's, it's, you know, a police officer told me one time, he said, you have to get lucky every day. I only have to get lucky once. And those are horrible odds. So everybody who's a criminal out there, the odds are stacked against you. And you've become pretty passionate about uh, reform in the judicial system in regards to jailing and, and prisoners? I just think that, that we've turned prisons into a, to a business. Once you privatize something, I think the rehabilitation went away from it. Kids don't belong in prison. Kids belong in school. So, and you, you just meet so many kids in prison and a lot of them are out of the foster care system. So that tells you 
our foster care system's broken, but you just don't have people looking at it, Mike, that I don't know why, but there's always politics or something in the way. Instead of looking at it and fixing it, there's red tape and it's sad. And, and people that would interact with you today who didn't know your story, didn't know your celebrity, would be really drawn to you because you're very personable. And for example, myself, um, I had COVID in November and I was very, very sick. And you personally contacted me a couple times and left food on my doorstep. That kind of kindness, where does it come from today, knowing that so much bitterness could have been a part of your character that's honestly just not there? I just try and do things that I would want people to do for me. If I'm sick, the other day I was on the phone with a friend of mine and I saw a lady walking down 26 mile road, an older lady, and I, had, I passed her and I said, oh man, and he said, what? I said, this lady's walking. She's half in the street. I turned around. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to pick her up and give her a ride. He said, man, you better be careful. I would want someone to pick me up. I would want someone to pick my mother up. So I picked her up. I told that, friend, that story to another friend. He called me yesterday and told me that he picked a dude up that was, I think he was with a walker. And he said, I want you to know you rubbed off on me a little bit because I never would have done that. When I started doing my food drives from prison, even in that dark place, the day that I knew that food was being given out and whether it was my friends giving it out or, you know, whoever was there doing that for me, I felt so good that day. It was like that one day, it was almost like I was free. But I was in prison, but that phone call and the pictures that I got knowing that they gave the food out at the church that day, it just made me feel good. So I continued to do it, and I've continued to do it since I've been home. And, and that food drive, how did that come about? I was talking to a friend of mine, and actually one of the guys that got me involved in it, he passed away recently. So he was like, you know, with your name, we could start a food drive and get people to give donations, and we could help, you know, the less fortunate, and we could start it off in your old neighborhood. And that's what I wanted to do. And you were able to orchestrate that? Yeah, I think I did it eight years while I was in prison, the wow. last eight years. And your voice is out here now, and your work is speaking for itself because you're such an advocate for those that are less fortunate and the vulnerable. How do you temper that and not have bitterness or revenge when you think about what was done to you? If I'm bitter, then they're still winning. But if I'm doing good things and I'm successful, then I'm winning. And that's kind of my, that's my to them, like, look at me now. You know what I mean? Like, I love the things that I do now, working with Team Wellness, working with Hale and Monaco. You know, there's, there's things that I do all by myself, the Macomb County Drug Courts. I go to the Veterans Drug Court graduation. They invited me now to the Drug Court graduation. I think it's next week. So going there and talking to those kids that are in the drug courts or these veterans, you know, that, that they don't think anyone cares about them. I'm one person, but I care about you. You know, my name brings a lot of recognition in the streets and, and people coming up and people with addiction. Like, you can have two or three degrees. And a lot of kids where I grew up, Mike, they could care less about that degree. They don't even know what it means. But if they talk to white boy Rick, they think they know what it means. So they'll listen to me a little more than they'll listen to someone with those two or three degrees. So I try and reach out to them. And if I can touch them a little bit and, and you know, an officer reached out to me the other day and probably this week, this kid's gonna get six months in jail. And he said, would you go to the jail with me and will you talk to this kid? And I said, you make the arrangements and I'll go. He knows the kid's not gonna listen to him but he'll listen to me because of who I am. The, the programs that, that, you know, through Team Wellness, through the things that I'm doing on my own, through the drug courts, 
you know, these are things <clears throat> that people need to know that just because you have a mental illness, it doesn't mean that nobody cares about you. Just because you have a drug problem, it doesn't mean that anybody, you know, has forgotten about you or that nobody cares about you. So these are things that, that I watch people go through. People in my family, I lost my aunt. I found my aunt dead when I was 15 years old from a drug overdose. So I know drugs, you know, hit close to home for me. And I know what I did as a kid by selling drugs was wrong. When you get in trouble and it's a nonviolent crime and, you know, actually a prosecutor brought it to my attention and she told me, she said, I would like to have, you know, a, a, a ladder or a scale, so to speak, or an elevator and say, your first time, you're going to go to team wellness and you're going to do this program. Your second time, I might find you and put you back in this program. And your third time, you have to go to jail to learn your lesson. But don't right off the bat send the person to jail because trust me, the person you're going to get back is going to be worse than the person you put in there. If you're having any kind of mental health crisis, we can help. At Team Wellness Crisis Centers, you'll be seen immediately. Stabilize in our own private facility and given all the care you need to get better. Don't wait. Call the Team Wellness Helpline at 1-888-813-TEAM. It could be your lifeline. Cheryl Kubiak, thank you for being here today. We've worked together on some task force and we're really honored that you've come here today as our expert in behavioral health and justice. And we're hoping that you can help expand on some of the ideas that we've heard from Rick Wershey's story about being incarcerated and having a mental illness or a substance abuse problem and the impact that it has on us. Thank you for being here. Michael, it's a pleasure to be here. Let's start by asking you to explain what is the ideal or idea for prisons and incarceration? Well, conceptually, prisons are supposed to incapacitate people, deter further crime, and also rehabilitate people. So when we talk about incapacitation, we talk about locking people up to protect them or protect society from them. Um, but how long and what does that mean? When we talk about deterrence, um, you're trying to deter people from subsequent crime, but what are you doing to address some of the reasons that they may be there in the first place? And finally, rehabilitation. How do we help people with new skills, with new behaviors? Does that rehabilitation become negated because of the prison environment? The other side of the coin, though, are those that are incarcerated who should not be there. I think that's a great point. And, and a phrase I'm hearing more and more often that I appreciate a great deal is we have to think about who we're afraid of versus who we're mad at, right? And so a lot of times people get incarcerated because we're mad at them. They didn't do what they said, what we said, thought they should do. Um, versus we're afraid of them, that we think that they're a menace to society or that they will hurt someone. What are some of the results or impact that you've seen happen to them as a result of it? So some of those people are children that shouldn't have been incarcerated. Mm -hmm. Some of those people are mm -hmm. mentally ill. Some have a developmental disability or a substance use disorder or a combination. Well, I'll start with the youth, and then I'd like to go into the mental health uh, issues in particular and the substance use. Um, but I think that the youth I, I worked on a, a project with those who were sent to state prison as youth, and they're between the ages of 14 and 17. And what I saw was many of them victimized inside the institution uh, by other inmates, sometimes staff, there's also violence inside uh, the prison, right? Physical, sexual violence by inmates, sometimes staff, 
And I think we can't ignore those things of, of what this institution does to people. But developmentally, they, hadn't, they don't have the psychological resources to cope, and they look for protection. And what happens is the protection that is offered in the prison system is, is really solitary confinement which also creates more mental health issues, right? Because how do you cope with being in a 10 by 10 cell for weeks or months or years at a time? And that often is a huge consequence in terms of people's recovery when they come out. Um, I think that the mental health issues that we've seen um, are when you have staff that are not trained to deal with mental health issues, there's often conflicts that happen, right? And so law enforcement or officers are, are used to the tools of their trade, right? Aggression, loud volumes, screaming. And what that does with someone who has a mental health issue is that it actually escalates the behavior because their own fear kicks in. Part of the problem is, is that once you get into the system, it's very difficult to get out of the system. But when you're there for a longer period of time, there's a dehumanization that happens because you become a number. You have no ability to make decisions, right? I mean, you're told when to sleep, you're told when to eat, you're told what to eat, uh, and where to go, and when to be there. So that there's a, an inability to, I think, think freely and autonomously that hinders people when they get out. Because you do not come out unscathed. Uh, you are going to be more impulsive, more angry about just little things because of the trauma that you've experienced, because of the hardship that you've experienced. And I think people rightfully so have those feelings and need to process those feelings to be able to move on and to be able to be their best selves. There's a lot of misinformation out there about you. A lot of um, conjecture, a lot of gossip, rumors. Tell us about you from your perspective, from growing up. As far as the misinformation, Mike, that, that, that's where I call the internet, as I've learned about it since I've been free, a free man, a blessing and a curse. Because you can post anything on the internet. People can put things that are total lies, total fabrications. There's no oversight. So there was a commercial, I think, before I, I watched it while I was inside, and it said, if it's on the internet, it's gotta be true. And I, I don't remember what the commercial was, but I used to laugh at it because there's so many things on the internet that are, that are mistruths about me. So, you know, for me, I laugh at a lot of them, but it's unfortunate that a lot of people in the world read those things and they think that it's true. You know, I've been called a gangster. I was the leader of an organization. I was this, I was that. So Rick, with all the things that have occurred, with all the injustice that occurred, how do you still stay with the persona you have today, positive? Do you channel your grandmother? You know, what influences you today? Listen, I have bitterness inside. I'm not going to, everybody does. When, when, when something's wrongfully done to you, but it's how you channel that bitterness. And for me, the hardest part about being away was the loved ones that I lost. My grandmother, my father, my grandparents. So many family members I lost, Mike, but you know, my grandmother to me was my rock as a child. My grandfather was, you know, my grandmother ran the household. So my grandmother was the shot caller. So whatever grandma said went, and she tried to keep me on the straight and narrow. I was a great little league baseball player. I played for the church. I got to play at Tiger Stadium before. I did all these amazing things. And when I lost my grandmother, I lost her fast after I went to prison. So I was so young and my whole life in there, I never forgot her. You know, my grandmother meant so much to me, Mike, that one of the things I used to do, you know, out of respect for my grandmother, Michael, was 
when she passed away, there was a prayer in her obituary. And I said that prayer every night until it was burned into my brain. And that was in 1988. And the prayer was, God hate not promise, skies always blue, flower stream pathways all our lives through. God hate not promise, sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God hate promise, strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trails, help from above, unfailing sympathy, undying love. And I would say that prayer and tell her that I love her. Every day I've said that prayer for 30 some years. And that's my little piece of respect to her. You know, it's difficult to sit here and talk to you about her because I never got to say goodbye. You know, I hope they're looking down and they know that I'm free. I hope that I'll be with them one day. I know that I will be, you know, but my grandmother was never a hateful person. So she always tried to help people. So for me, out of respect for her, the church thing for my grandfather, you know, I try and do these good things and, and as you said, channel them. And a lot of times they said, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. So a lot of times when I want to open my big mouth, I keep it shut out of respect for them. Do you think you've forgiven the people that were responsible for your um, injustice? I've forgiven, but I haven't forgotten. Because every day those people that did that to me, they look in the mirror. And I didn't serve almost 33 years in prison for the crime that I committed, trust me. They punished me for what I did to certain people because of corruption. Corruption is what kept me in prison for 33 years, Mike, not the crime that I committed. If you could say one thing to every kid in America, what would you say to them today? Get an education and never give up. Life gets better. When, when you think you're at the lowest point of your life, there's nowhere to go but up. And Mike, with everything I've been through, I can look at you and say, I'm still standing. I'm as strong as ever and I'm still standing. At Team Wellness Primary Care Center, you will find all the basic services you need to be well and stay well. Come in for all your screenings. Come in for routine physicals and checkups. Come in for full service dentistry. Come in for vaccinations and immunizations. At Team Wellness Primary Care Center, we take care of your total health. Team Wellness Primary Care Center. Come on in. At Team Wellness Dental Clinics, you'll find plenty to smile about. Our friendly professional dentists and hygienists are here to give you the full range of preventative and remedial care you need for a beautiful, lasting smile. From diagnostics to routine cleanings, our team does it all, right in your neighborhood. So whether you come to us or we come to you, you'll get the kind of dental care you need to keep smiling. Team Wellness Dental Clinics, now serving communities all over Metro Detroit. Anxiety, depression, can happen to anyone for all kinds of reasons, especially during difficult and trying times that no one should have to go through alone. At Team Wellness, trained, compassionate, caring professionals will get you into the right treatment so you get better. Team Wellness, you are not alone. Thank you for joining us today as we relive the 32-year journey to justice of Rick Worshey Jr. If you'd like to learn more about this or any mental health issue, please visit our website at MyHealthyMind.com, on Facebook at My Healthy Mind Show, or on Twitter. We'll see you next week for another edition of My Healthy Mind. Let's talk about it.
Don't forget to like, share, comment, and subscribe for more content from My Healthy Mind. Let's talk about it. Until recently, people in psychiatric crisis had very few options. Basically, they could be taken to a hospital emergency room in inpatient treatment, or to jail. But now, there's a better way. Team Wellness Psychiatric Urgent Care Center of Metro Detroit, an official certified community behavioral health clinic. What this means is that now, people experiencing any kind of mental health or substance abuse crisis can be taken immediately and directly into treatment at our safe, certified crisis stabilization unit. To be immediately assessed, stabilized, and triaged by our team of intake medical doctors and psychiatrists. To undergo intensive psychiatric therapy for up to 23 hours in one of our private or semi-private rooms. To be fully evaluated for short-term care and given a warm handoff into proper ongoing treatment. And to receive continuing long-term clinical and peer support services based on a thorough, thoughtful discharge plan drawn up case by case. For those in the throes of a substance abuse crisis, our response would be the effective, evidence-based practice for treating substance abuse including Suboxone. In cases of attempted suicide, certified suicide prevention specialists are on call and our mobile crisis response team ready for dispatch. In any mental health emergency, our psych urgent care unit is open 24-7 to receive and treat those in crisis. And in all these cases, law enforcement can bring the subjects to team wellness to divert from jail or the emergency room. This kind of direct access will save time and save lives. Team Wellness Psychiatric Urgent Care. Certified. Safe.